given my spot, so I appreciate that too. <laughs> but I do have a little bit of a spin on it. Um, I want to introduce a, um, a little bit of a downer. Um, there are some people actually skeptical of the idea that the taste of a rock can be felt in wine itself. Um, one of them is uh, Maltman. It's one of my favorite quotes, actually. Um, and so um, to me, those are fighting words. And uh, our project was actually to try and find something simple and easy to understand that is in the wine that could be used to relate it back to uh, the geology uh, itself. Ironically, Maltman was one of the reviewers of our paper. Um, and they published it anyway, which is fortunate for us. <laughs> um, I won't dwell too much on um, the nature of the Willamette Valley and its various um, bedrocks, but I do want to point out something that hasn't been mentioned so far. One of my favorite things is this color here, Miocene bauxite. Some of the jewelry soils are developed uh, on bauxite, believe it or not, not just basalt. And sadly, there's still a little bit of soil science confusion about this, but bauxite and basalt are actually quite different parent materials in terms of their nutrient uh, status. Um, and that bauxite is actually no trivial um, matter. It's a Miocene paleosol. And so it's exposed in some places on benches, but in other places in section. Here it is in section, um, about 17 meters of it. Uh, it's a thick tropical soil that represents a Miocene age, middle Miocene age incursion of tropical forests into Oregon during the greenhouse maximum of the middle uh, Miocene. Probably uh, a climatic uh, change due to the intrusions of the Columbia River basalts uh, as they weld up out of the ground in Idaho and eastern Oregon. It was a major event for Oregon, and it transformed the Lamp Valley into a tropical jungle, as opposed to the current oak savanna that you see. This was a major climatic event that had um, an effect on the terroir of some Oregon wines, particularly um, those of this vineyard here, Lamp Valley vineyards. I won't dwell on this. We've heard quite a bit about the difference between the Jory, the Willikensee. We haven't talked too much about the Woodburn, but they're the ones that are um, overfed. Those are the ones that uh, give too much vigor to the grape and require special management to produce a reasonable wine product. Um, my um, initial foray into this experiment was with my wife and we went out bravely going where everyone goes before and that is to the vineyard tasting rooms and seeing if we could taste the geology um, in the wine and we were very enthusiastic and the next morning in the fog of a very severe headache we decided that is not the way to do this project. Um, the way to do this project is, um, uh, I decided, was to actually use these really quite wonderful wine information sheets that are now issued by just about every vineyard. Um, a little less than half of the Oregon vineyards now have a wine sheet for each wine that they produce. And they specify whether it's blended from a variety of different grapes from different parts of the valley or whether it comes from a single block. Um, and they give a lot of interesting information, um, including um, pH. Um, including uh, all sorts of other information, which then we can use to go to a soil survey to find information on the soil from which that was uh, grown. So uh, my role in this project was um, largely as a computer jockey with a gigantic spreadsheet, seeing if there were any relationships between soil type and wine um, chemistry. And I, I was very grateful to have Scott Burns to keep me honest and to correct some of my more egregious errors in my initial trial at this work. And this is the main result that we got, which was kind of surprising to me, um, and that is that there is quite a strong inverse correlation between the pH of the wine and the pH of the soil from which it is grown. We saw this very strongly in the 2009 vintage. We kept the vintages separate because we wanted it to be a controlled experiment. We wanted everything to be the same about each uh, particular series, uh, except for the variable that we're interested in, which is pH. And pH is a very fascinating one to me um, because um, it is a very important element of soil chemistry. It summarizes a lot about what's going on in a soil. But it also, in the wine, has a very strong effect on the taste of the wine. 
Uh, a very low pH wine is quite astringent, almost vinegary. A very high pH wine has that lovely buttery taste at the end uh, of the tongue uh, and seems quite a bit more rich and uh, mellow. Uh, many aspects of the taste of wine are related to pH. So we're very happy with this result because it shows, I think, Maltman might have been a little bit mistaken about um, dissing the idea of tasting soil in wine. You can taste at least one pretty fundamental variable of soil and of um, the wine itself. We also found this relationship, which is really quite um, interesting. It's actually a direct relationship between the pH of the wine and the pH and the depth to the base of the soil clay BT horizon. Uh, these two variables turn out to be related, actually, because the lowest pH in our sample was actually at the very base of the profiles, which are relatively deep uh, profiles. So these two relationships are actually showing the same thing. We found quite a strong relationship in 2009, pretty good in 2011, not so good in 2008 and 2010. Um, we have quite a variety of soils to choose from, as has been emphasized in previous talks, uh, which gave us a nice range of pH um, and also quite a nice range in uh, the depth to the base of the clay BT horizon. And we needed to include all the soils uh, because uh, we were interested in seeing the total variation in these variables in our particular uh, field. Now, of course, many people would say, oh, that pH relationship, that's obviously the winemaker is doing that. Um, we don't think so uh, because um, fortunately a few, sadly too few, uh, of the sheets that we had also reported the pH of the juice of the grapes immediately after they were collected. Uh, and um, there's a very strong relationship between grape pH and wine pH. Uh, quite a strong one in 2009 again, um, not so strong in other vintages, but still uh, quite prominently um, there. This is something that the soil is transferring to um, the grapes and is coming through in the wine itself. Now, the variation in different vintages was quite fascinating to us, and we had, um, we ran a simple regression on each one, and we used, we had an R squared. Um, we found that actually the coefficient of correlation of wine versus soil pH was actually very strongly related to the size of the harvest. And we estimated the size of the harvest in two different ways, from a single uh, set of vineyards, um, their tonnage, and also from Oregon agricultural statistics, and both relationships have very high correlation. Uh, this indicates to us that when there's plenty of grapes around, the, the vintners don't seem to um, alter the wine all that much. The, the relationship comes through quite strongly. Uh, when there are a few grapes around, there seems to be a lot of meddling with the wine, and so the relationship is not quite so strong. Um, it turns out um, that our vintages were not the best ones, uh, ranked um, by Wine Spectator uh, magazine, or the Wine Advocate um, uh, magazine, uh, the ones that the uh, connoisseurs really esteem. Uh, it turns out that climate rules um, all, um, that it's not uh, just pH that's creating the really good uh, high uh, pH wines that have more flavor to them. Um, it is uh, the absence of precipitation in October. I thought this relationship was quite uh, striking. This is from our data set um, and uh, versus the October precipitation at Newburgh. The lower it is, it seems um, the better the wine ranking in terms of what the connoisseurs are looking for. Um, we did not address the Willamette Valley debate that Scott outlined, the spice versus fruit debate. We did not address slaty or earthy flavors, which was um, uh, the, the, the bete noir of Maltman in his uh, comment that started me going on all this. But we did support a couple of uh, really common lines of wisdom among vintners for many, many um, years. And those two um, aphorisms are treat vines mean to keep them keen and uh, deep-rooted vines better express um, terroir. We think we actually have uh, some relationships that demonstrate that there's quite a bit of truth to these old sayings which vintners have instinctively followed for quite some, uh, some years. Now, I, I know when people get to the end of a talk and there's a lot of text, your heart sinks and you think, oh, he's going to read it. Well, I'm not going to read it. I'm going to sing it. And um, be... Uh, be free to sing it along yourself. Uh, the tune is As Time Goes By, from the, which is made famous by the movie Casablanca. 
Lambert Valley wines from Pinot Noir vines derive their taste for low. When pH of the wine is high, so pH was low. The less acidic wine will spoil given time, but fruitful it is so sublime. In contrast are the grapes well fed with acid edge. When vines are feeling stressed, they seem to be impressed to do their very best to foster every mammal's need to scatter seed. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>